are the women's ministry will be having a meeting in the mansion tomorrow at 6 30 p.m. If there are any questions please con contact Jolene Eriks. This Wednesday night we'll be watching the movie in the manner Tortured for Christ in place of our master's Bible study class. Popcorn will be provided. The movie starts at 6 30 rather than 7 o'clock. If you haven't gotten a ticket for the Lincoln Day dinner, you can see Craig Eriks. It will be held Friday, April 12th at 6 p.m. at the LaCroix Hall in the Rushmore Civic Center. Last chance, he says. He's right back there. Go see him and get a ticket. Five o'clock, the door's open? Okay, there you go. There will be a bridal shower on Saturday, April 13th for Jade Wilson at 9.30 to 11 in the mansion, a.m. in the mansion. And the VBS, uh, VBS meeting will follow at 12 o'clock noon. Pizza will be provided for the meeting. If you'd like to volunteer for the VBS, see Amy right there. We need lots of volunteers. We've got a ton of kids this year, 85 at the last count. Awesome. Okay, see Amy Wilson or show up for the meeting at 12 o'clock on the 13th. If you'd like to order landmark wear, we have all sizes of hoodies, 
and available in the back for you to try on. And our new grace, gray baseball hats have arrived. Please fill out the order sheet and you can pay when your order arrives. They're laying right back there on the table. Go try them out. They're really neat hoodies. Don't forget to bring your favorite dish to our annual Easter morning breakfast, which will start at 8.30 in the mansion, Easter Sunday. Information on, on our upcoming Seder and Easter events has been provided in the bulletin. You can sign up for the Seder at www.rapidcitypassover.evenbright.com. Located in the back of the chapel is our offering box, and if you need Bibles, there are some back there you can use. Okay, and I'm going to introduce Amy Wagner to you now. She's got some info for us. Well, I don't know how many of you heard what our governor did. Um, one thing I want to remind you of before I get started here, and I'll forget it if I don't mention it. We do have prayer ushers uh, at the close of every service. Um, we all wear these name tags. Uh, well, if we remember them. <laughs> and um, we're available to pray with you during the last song at the end of the service and afterwards too. So I didn't want to forget that. Um, let me just read the proclamation from our governor. Executive proclamation, state of South Dakota, office of the governor. Whereas South Dakota has suffered from an unprecedented disaster caused by blizzard conditions and widespread flooding, which has profoundly affected the livelihoods and living conditions of citizens. And whereas throughout our history, South Dakotans have united in prayer to God to humbly ask for strength and steadfastness during times of difficulty. And whereas prayer provides peace and guidance in times of crisis and conflict and reminds us of the comforting assurance of God's love for us all. And whereas it seems right and fitting that the citizens of South Dakota are urged to pray for the well-being of our fellow citizens and our state, to pray for all those in other states who are hurt by this disaster, to pray for those who are working to respond to this crisis, and to pray for all recovery efforts. And now, therefore, I, Christy Nome, governor of the state of South Dakota, do hereby proclaim Sunday, September 7th, 2019, as statewide day of prayer in South Dakota and encourage individuals to pray their, on their own or with others as an expression of faith and hope. In witness thereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused to be affixed the great seal of the state of South Dakota in Pierre, the capital city, this first day of May, April, sorry, first day of April in the year of our Lord, 2019, Christy Nome Governor. Stephen Barnett also signed that. <laughs> Christy Nome joins um, three other governors, the governor of South Dakota, North Dakota, Iowa, and Nebraska, all jointly declared um, today to be a day of prayer for our states and for those victims affected by the flooding. Um, I want you to know that the National Day of Prayer had a hand in that. And my friend Karen Bowling in Nebraska was the key starter on that. Um, she's the executive director of Nebraska Family Alliance, and she's also a state coordinator for the National Day of Prayer in Nebraska. And she came up with these um, prayer points that we're going to pray this morning, and the acronym is STRONG. Um, strategy, transition, rebuilding, overcomers, necessary, necessities, and grace. Join with me in prayer. I will bless, bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Father, Father of glory, 
give us the spirit of wisdom and insight to the re in the rebuilding of the infrastructure, homes, farmlands, ranch lands, families, and those affected in, the, in a very dire way, those on our reservations. Father, we lift up individual and, com and community resiliency to adapt and adjust. Father, make straight paths for the feet of those who are affected by this flooding. And Lord, we, re we lift up the rebuilding. We ask for safety and skilled laborers to do quality and organized work. And we pray, Lord, that no one would be left out. Lord, we lift up the overcomers for God's, your encouragement, for emotional and physical strength for those affected by this flood. Be near them and encourage them. Open your ears and your heart to the broken. And Father, we lift up the necessities. We pray and are asking for the needs to be met. Statewide supplies and finances to be provided for all those who are recovering and will continue to recover from this flooding. And Lord, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Lord, we, pr we ask for your enabling grace for our neighbors. And we pray for neighbors to take care of neighbors, whether that's across state lines, county lines, or farm lines, just across the fence. Lord, we pray that hearts would be lifted and that your love would abound as we care for one another. We thank you, Lord, for godly governors who are willing to take a stand for righteousness and to bow their knee to you. And Lord, I don't want to leave this, this microphone without lifting up our sister Ruthie, who will undergo her third surgery tomorrow to fix a hip. Lord, we pray that this will be the final and successful surgery for her, that her pain will be relieved, that her hip will be aligned and righted, and that she will be able to sit and walk and stand and do what you ask her to do in your name, Lord, we ask for her healing. Be with us, Lord. Let our hearts be turned toward you as we lift our voices in worship to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now would you stand and greet one another as we prepare to sing. Just on the G, or the A, A for the A. Yeah. Just, yeah, just stay on the A for the intro.
free to be seated. My name is Mike Gressler. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm a member of this church. Been coming here for a while, and uh, I want to thank you all for coming. And I want to thank Scott Craig for allowing me to take the pulpit in his absence. Um, <laughs> I'm getting signals from from the uh, kids' church that it's time to announce that kids can head that way. So. Kids, you're dismissed. As I was saying before I was interrupted by Scott Craig Jr., uh, that's not something that a lot of pastors are comfortable doing um, without trepidation. And I hope we're all grateful that Pastor Scott is comfortable with members of his own fellowship filling in for him. I know it's inspiring to me personally and demonstrates his love and confidence he has all in us. And uh, this morning... I got here and Phil asked me how I was doing. I said, well, I'm a scared. And he said, don't worry, I got your back. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> I told him if I pass out, do not give me an ambulance ride. That is the ride of shame for a firefighter to take a ride in an ambulance. So I'll get there my own way. And really, Pastor Scott doesn't have anything to worry about with people filling in for him. I mean, he's a fantastic communicator. He uh, can teach the Bible like nobody's business. He can shred a guitar if he wants to. Uh, he can sing. He's got perfect hair. He's got a seventh degree black belt in Taekwondo. The guy has nothing to worry about. As for me, this is my first time preaching. And since it might be my only time, this is my one shot to deliver a message that's been building up inside of me for a number of years. Um, and before I, I begin, I think I should say a couple of personal disclaimers. First one would be, I can't remember the last time I had an original thought, if I ever did have one. So anything I say today that might sound wise to you came from this book and uh, from a long list of people who have influenced me over the years, some I've never met, and some of whom are in the room today. Another disclaimer, try as I might, I'm still a hypocrite. And uh, the things I will say today are not necessarily the things I can do all the time. I have to look at my family when I say that one. Um, and, you know, I might strive and I might think I'm doing the right thing, but then when I look over my shoulder, I realize I've failed to meet the expectations of other folks and even myself. So, disclaimer number two. And despite my failings and my rather inglorious history... <clears throat> I've invited a lot of people to come out for the service today, and a number of them are here. So, church family, please welcome my extended family and my family and my friends, and uh, please welcome each other. Okay, the title of this message is uh, World Without Love, and... Uh, it seems like this day the world is indeed without love, or at best, extremely lacking in love. Day by day, the competing ideologies become more strident, vicious even. As a result, more than a few of us, me included, have started turning away from the echo chambers. It's gotten to the point where it's enough just to make a person sick at heart. And uh, it's not good. And I don't know what the answer is other than uh, the only one we have left, and that's to... We better start employing love in this world soon. And as bad as it seems to be getting, it's still nothing new. In fact, throughout the history of mankind, and especially the history of the Bible, um, uh, it's been this way in one part of the world or another all along. And thankfully for us, Christ Jesus addressed this problem of the lack of love and speaks directly to us about it. So that will be our takeaway for today. Judging from the centuries full of songs and poems and books and now movies about love, mankind appears to have a kaleidoscope view of what love is and how it affects the human condition. 
In my time on earth, the meaning of love has changed for me personally more times than I can remember. And each time it changes, a new, more profound and deeper aspect that was never known or felt before comes about. So while I won't take the time today to tell you what I think love is, even so, I will be talking about love this morning and how I think we humans mess it up. With respect to love, or more accurately loving, some folks aren't very good at it. And even the most loving among us here this morning can still do better. I'm supposed to have a slide change here. Hey, Tony, can you help me out with slide number one, please? No. <laughs> I need the T-Rex slide, Tony. Yeah, the T-Rex slide. There we go. So, not shaming on T-Rexes here, or please don't be offended if you are a T-Rex, but I mean, we're just not very good at it. We, we say we love people, and they're like, that's not very much. That's, that's not what I had in mind. And because some of the people in this church today knew me before I knew Jesus, they've seen me at my absolute worst, and I'm talking my absolute worst. And I'm looking out, and I'm counting roughly about a dozen, and I might have rethought that before I invited you, but... Um, <laughs> I want to tell a story that hopefully establishes some credibility for my message today, so it's important that you're here. Um, I have a story that uh, I want to tell, and it takes a little while to tell, but it's important because it's one of those things that happened to me, and after it happened, everything changed after that. Kind of like when, I'm sorry, but Brenna Michael Perryman, when she was born, my first grandchild, after that day, everything was different. I didn't want to work. I didn't want to play golf. I just wanted to wait by the phone for my daughter to call and say, hey, is it okay if Brenna comes over? Because it always was. Um, so anyway, in, in 2010, I went on a trip to Israel with my church family at that time. Um, and uh, uh, in order to get the best rates on everything for a tour to Israel, uh, we had to partner with another church in Rapid City to get our numbers up. Um, so some of the people I knew, but uh, some of them I had yet to meet. And because you can only fly so many people out of Rapid City at once, because we're Rapid City, half of us went the first day, I was on the first day, and then the other half followed us uh, 24 hours later. Um, <laughs> and Sister Pat forgot her passport, so she, but you made it on day two. Uh, just before the flight over to Israel, we uh, were reviewing the nine-day itinerary, and Pastor Greg used that opportunity to lay out for me what my duties were going to be once we got to Israel. He wanted me to be the guy that um, kept track of everyone when we were out touring at the various sites. He wanted me to keep track of everyone, and when it was like 10 minutes before time to leave, start moving people toward the bus, round them all up and then uh, get them on the bus and then do a head count. And uh, so basically always, always be watching, always do a sweep. And uh, if I knew what I was talking about today, I would say it was a, more of a sheepdog role. Uh, and because Jody didn't accompany me on the trip, and because the trip was based on double occupancy, I wound up rooming with the pastor. Pretty much based on the fact that I don't snore much. Um, so that first night, uh, he told me that I'd have to, once we're in Israel, one, that first night he told me I was going to have to step up my game for the next day. Um, we we're going to go to this site that was huge and he'd, he'd been to Israel before and he knows that people just wander off like hundreds of yards away and he can't hardly keep track of them. And, uh, I'm, I'm like, whoa, wait, because... Today didn't go so great already, and now um, you got this huge responsibility, and it's kind of really not what I signed up for on this trip. And he's like, 
you got this. You're the one I want to do this. No one else really here can do it but you. With your fire department background, this is a natural fit for you. Don't worry, you can handle it. And by the way, if I were you first thing in the morning, I'd deputize some help. So um, now good night and don't snore, you know. And the next morning I got up early. I got up at dawn and decided to go for a swim. Our hotel was on the Mediterranean coast. So I thought, hey, go for a dip. And um, 99 out of 100 mornings, I wake up with a new start. Yesterday's problems are over. Today's got new promise. Uh, it's going to be a better day. This was the one out of 100 day where I woke up with just worry and fear and anxiety that I was going to mess up and disappoint everyone. And, but I'm in the Mediterranean. I'm floating. And, but I'm running through my head all these things like uh, I, people aren't even listening to me now. And I've got, you know, double the number. And... This is a job for a cop. I'm not a cop. I'm a fireman. People like firemen. They don't like cops. <laughs> I'm not a tolerant person. I don't have the kind of patience this job's going to require. Um, I don't know people's names. And I'm horrible at names. They tell me their names and whew, I forget it immediately. So I'm, I know it sounds like I'm whining. And quite truthfully, now in my own voice, it does sound like whining. But... I was really just uh, just feeling the, the pressure of the responsibility and not wanting to let anyone down. And you'd think that the opportunity to swim in the warm, soothing Mediterranean would have calmed me down some, but, but no. So um, I started to pray. And it was one of those desperate prayers, the kind where you tell God that you are in a big jam and you can't see your, your way out of it but also the kind of prayer where you say, I know you've got a plan for this, God. I know you're going to take care of it, and I know things are going to work out. But like 15 minutes from now, the day is going to start, and i got to hit the ground rolling, so could you please help me quickly? And here I am in the promised land and, you know, surrounded by God's chosen people. I mean, if there was ever a, like a pipeline, I'm in it, so... Please, God, help me now. That, and it was desperate. And I, I left the water, and I went and got ready for the day. And just really didn't feel better. Not that feeling like, you. well, phew, I've offloaded this to God. He's going to handle it. I just, it well, it wasn't there for me. And I, after breakfast, I met with some of the guys and gave them my best deputize the brother speech. And a few of them said, you know, yeah, I think I can help out. But we didn't have time to go over the plan or what I needed even. And... Um, Still, so I'm still anxious. Um, so, uh, Tony, I'm going to, there we go. Oops, one, two, four. So the first stop was a place called Caesarea Maritime. And uh, this is a picture of the amphitheater, but um, Caesarea Maritime was a, an ancient city that was built over 12 years and, and dedicated in 10 B.C. by King, by King Herod. Um, and uh, it came to be a port city. And so uh, there was an amphitheater and a hippodrome, which is like, like a chariot racetrack. Um, theater, amphitheater, hippodrome, temples. Big site, big, big site. And then they went out into the sea, built breakwaters and piers and wharfs and docks. And, and so in the day, they could, they could handle 600 ships at this location. So a big site. Um, our first order of business, though, was to go to the um, amphitheater. I'm pointing at the screen. May I should be pointing at them here? Yeah, there we go. So the first picture you saw was looking at the whole amphitheater itself, which is a big half circle. And then this is from the seats in the amphitheater looking out past the stage. So you can sort of see where um, the breakwaters are and that we're right by the sea and Obviously a beautiful place. Yeah, actually great. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to Israel, don't wait. You should go. Um, anyway, the significance of this is that in the book of Acts, in chapter 25, we hear that Paul gave his testimony at this place. 
Paul was a Roman citizen, and he'd been arrested in, Jus in Jerusalem. And so he had appealed that since I'm a Roman citizen, I want Caesar to rule on this, not the Jews in Jerusalem, because they were going to kill him. So unfortunately, he was going to be after sent to Rome to have that trial, and a waypoint was to camp out at um, Caesarea Maritime, which was the the seat of the Roman government for that area. So that's why Paul was there. And so Paul had an opportunity to give his testimony here to uh, Festus, King Agrippa, Bernice, all the, the local officials at the time. So that's the reason why we stopped there was for the significance of, of what happened there. Um, one of the benefits of traveling with a group of 50 some people, uh, church people mainly, is that at the end of the tour, everybody downloads their pictures into one folder. And so everybody's got everybody's pictures. And I was able to comb through literally hundreds of photos. And the next two pictures are spot on exactly what happened when I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. Um, so here, can you see, if everyone can see the green dot over here. Let's see, this is me right here. Uh, shirt, shorts, in fact, this shirt right here. Not superstitious, you know, don't believe in luck, but, you know, why not, right? Um, so this is, this is our group filing in to the amphitheater, and we're going to be sitting right here. The next, the next slide will show everyone sitting right there. Oh, wait, can we go back just one more, please? Thank you. So this group here was singing worship at the time. And this is me camped out behind them because I'm just like, this is exactly what I need at this moment. It gave me some something to focus on besides my own troubles and calm. And they were singing uh, Amazing Grace and the modernized version where we add the extra verses, the ones that we sing in church now. Um, and it was just, it was perfect. And... I was camped out there, and I'm supposed to be watching things like one of our people up here standing on the bench up here taking pictures, and these two running off over here. There was also another guy over here. That, that guy is the one that took the picture from, you know, the stage. So I stayed here until these people were done, and, and the Sanford Theater has several groups there at once, and you just kind of have to wait your turn because you might get loud and... The other people can't hear their presentation. So we waited our turn. Okay, next slide, please. Um, now, by now I'd moved, but picture me back where I originally was. So, Pat Lay, I believe you're the only one here today that is in this picture. And Pat, you are, whoops. Man, I got, I'm so good with technology, you can't believe it. I'll let Tony fix it. Anyway, so... So Pat was there in that picture and, and some of, a lot of the folks that we know. But um, what happened was, after those, that group stopped singing, I looked over and my group was all assembled. And for a moment, and I'm literally talking, you know, 1001, 1002, for literally a moment, I was given a glimpse of how God sees his children. And uh, I'm sorry, words aren't available for me to describe what it was like, but I'll, I'll try. It was like they were glowing or shining somehow, um, like a golden uh, glow about them. And it was me seeing those people through God's eyes. And, and uh, I mean, how exquisite and infinitely precious we are in his sight, how unconditionally loved we are. And uh, I know now, I, I, I've got an appreciation for the biblical authors that have been trying to describe these things in scriptures that we read, things like faces shining as the sun or raiments white as light and so forth. Our, our words just fall short of describing these things. But, uh, but I need you to understand that what I saw was as real to me as... Uh, this moment is standing up here right now. It was not a trick of my eyes or something like the sun bursting out from a cloud. It was a, a bluebird clear sky day. Uh, 
not a vision, not a hallucination, or anything more than just a glimpse through my, you know, middle-aged, nearsighted eyes uh, of how God truly sees us. And even with that limitation, it was still spectacular. I saw it that day and haven't seen it since, but I really don't need to. I'll never forget that sight or the insight of clarity and enlightenment that went along with it. And maybe someone here today has, has had that same experience where you've actually been able to see things through God eyes, God's eyes for just a moment. Um, I know I'm not the only one on earth that's ever had that. But I realized it was for me and just for me. It wasn't like I was going to go, hey, everybody, wait. You, I just, you can't believe what I just saw. I just saw you through God's eyes, and he really loves us, and you're, it was awesome. And So, no, I just had to be cool. I just had to internalize it, you know, and just, just sit there. I'm not even sure I, I listened to the lesson, to be honest with you. But uh, here's the point to my story, Okay. For the next seven days, my job as the last guy on the bus went perfectly. I was able to look at everyone through a different lens, one that started out not as my own, but became my own. I quickly knew each person by name and how to uniquely serve each one with patience and kindness, each according to their individual characteristics and needs. The stress evaporated. The worry ceased. In fact, everyone was so gracious and so cooperative that we actually were ahead of schedule most days, and we got to see, add more stops to our, our itinerary. We got to see more of Israel. Um, so, Pat, you were with me on that trip. That's how, that's how it went. That's how it came about. That's how I did it. Um, <laughs> better said, that is how God chose to answer that desperate prayer that morning. He answered it in a way that not only got me out of the jam I was in, but changed my outlook from that point forward. So it wasn't the true me, um, but him inspiring me to become someone I couldn't have been on my own. And what he gave me that morning in that place halfway around the world is the gift that just keeps on giving. It's everlasting to this day. The genius of God and the way he answers prayers is just absolutely magnificent. All right, so... Hopefully I've got some credibility with the folks that know me for a long time. And now I want to make some bold statements about love. Three bold statements. Um, bold statement number one, God's will is clear. We are to love others. And I could read all the verses in the Bible that support that, but that would pretty much take up the day. And suffice it to say, there's about 300 of them and over half are in the New Testament alone. So... We're not to love only the ones that we know, only our family members, only our relatives and our friends, but even those that are hard to love. So what does the Lord and Savior have to say about this? In Matthew 22, beginning in verse 36, Jesus is asked, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So who's this neighbor that we're supposed to love anyway? And the well-known parable of the Good Samaritan has the answer. And you remember, a man is robbed, beaten, and left half dead on the side of the road. A priest and later a Levite pass by, but they go to the other side of the road to avoid helping the man. Complete hypocrites, by the way. But a Samaritan, a man hated by the Jews only because of where he was from, helped the half-dead man. And not only helped him with medical treatment, but paid in advance for his convalescence and even checked back later to see if there was an outstanding bill. This Samaritan was hated by the Jews, but he showed his true love for the Jewish man regardless. So the answer to who is your neighbor is anyone of any race, creed, or social background who's in need. And folks, that's according to Jesus. Then there is the love your neighbor as yourself part. So as yourself, what does that mean? We, we're supposed to love ourselves. Is that, is that what that means or does it mean something else? And I, I've been around long enough and been in my own skin long enough, better to say. Um, here's the deal. 
we cut ourselves a tremendous amount of slack. I mean, and that's our fallen nature. We're on our own mind so much, we don't even notice it. And the default human position is to always give ourselves the benefit of the doubt over others. And perhaps that's why Jesus commands us in this way. He also is the one that told us to first take the plank out of your own eye, and then we'll be able to see clearly to remove the sliver from our brother's eye. Now, there's no denying that there's some downright nasty people in this world who, from every indication, are hell-bound. Maybe God's rejected them as godless and wicked, but maybe not. We don't know that for sure. And we don't get to judge their eternal destiny. Only he does. Jim Daly of Focus on the Family spoke in Rapid City at the Stand Bank when a few years ago and said this, and I'll, I'll never forget what he said. But he said, if a blind man steps on your foot, do you get angry at him? Consider that these people I just talked about are blind. And none are so blind as those who will not see. So what do you think? Are we to love these people? Bold statement number two. God has already told us clearly and in detail how to properly express this love he speaks of. So, uh, for us, the proper expression of love is not something that we have learned along the way uh, through trial and error or failed relationships or life experiences. We've got, we got a culture affecting us with romanticism and misinformation and misconceptions, and they're all part of everyone's current upbringing in, in this day and age. And you hear philosophies like, you must love yourself before you can truly love others. And maybe somebody can explain that one to me. I've never really understood it. Another one is, you have to give love to get love. And that's patently not true. Jesus loved us enough to die for us while we were still yet sinners. Most people in the world don't love him, and many never will. And they also don't tell you that real love involves sacrifice. That part is barely mentioned. It's also important to realize the word love is also a verb. It's an action word and not a feeling. It's something we must intentionally choose to do. In his book, The Man in the Mirror, Patrick Morley writes, The kind of love that scripture directs us to is willful love rather than emotional love. Scriptural love is agape love, which means to love in a moral sense. It is a deliberate act of the will as a matter of principle, duty, and propriety. So because we've all been indoctrinated with the cultural romanticism and misconceptions of love, we don't understand sometimes what it is that God would have us do. Fortunately for us, he has given us some tools. Tony, could I have the tools slide, please? <laughs> So, still not shaming the T-Rex, short arms, got to make it work. Um, these are specific step-by-step -step instructions from God, so easy to follow that even beginners can get it right the first try. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, my favorite chapter in the Bible, probably always will be, is where we find love's how-to manual, troubleshooting guide, and it even includes a guarantee at the end. Uh, first, though, we need to take the context of that chapter into account. So Paul wrote this letter to the church of Corinth, the Corinthians. And it was orig originally addressed to them for a reason, and it's because they were doing things wrong. And they were treating each other poorly. We won't get into it, but that's basically why he wrote it. And so this chapter wasn't written because it makes for a great wedding service. Yes, it does but I see it a little bit differently. I believe it was the Apostle Paul giving that church a reproof and correction aimed at getting them right-minded. And so I think that pretty much sounds like it was written for us today as well. <clears throat> Let me read the passage, and I want you to please listen to it as I read it. And ask, does it describe a list of feelings, or does it describe a list of behaviors? So from the New International Version, starting in verse 4, 
Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Verse 5. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Continuing in verse 6, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And I'll read verse 7 from the Amplified Version. Love bears all things regardless of what comes, believes all things looking for the best in each one, hopes all things remaining steadfast during difficult times, and endures all things without weakening. Have you ever thought that perhaps Paul listed these things in priority order? There's a reason why patience comes at the top and then followed by kindness. Um, and what would people think of you if you were always patient and always kind? I mean, just those two. They would think you were like one of the most lovely people in the world. And you're just, you're just starting down the list and still you're, you're almost halfway there. Uh, and here's the neat, the neat part of this. Nowhere does it say that you must feel warmth and affection towards someone in order to be patient and kind, because you don't. Going back to the beginning of the chapter, verses 1 through 3 say, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. The great Francis Schaeffer said, Biblical orthodoxy without compassion is surely the ugliest thing in the world. President Teddy Roosevelt said, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Look, only God knows the heart. He knows the motives that are behind the way that we respond to others. Love is more than simply warm feelings. It is an attitude that reveals itself in action. How can we love others as Jesus loves us? By helping when it's not convenient. By giving when it hurts by devoting energy to others' welfare rather than our own, by absorbing hurts from others without complaining or fighting back. This kind of loving is hard to do. That is why people notice when you do it and know that you are empowered by a supernatural source. And that's why when you are bitter or cranky or expect something in return, it doesn't matter what you say or do for people. It won't truly feel like love to them. The Bible says you will be as undesirable, undesirable to be around as a loud gong. Now on the flip side, what if it doesn't work out? What if the person returns our best efforts at love with nothing, or with rejection, or even with hatred? Troubleshooting guide. Are we doing it right? Um, consult the list. Have we been patient? Have we been kind? Work through it. Check to see if you might be missing a need that the other person has. David Jeremiah says, let your love manifest itself in compassion and let compassion result in action on behalf of those in need. And don't give up on them because, bold statement number three, love never fails. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 13 and read verse 8. And I'm going to read again from the Amplified Version. Love never fails, never fades out or becomes obsolete or comes to an end. As for prophecy, the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose, it will be fulfilled and pass away. As for tongues, they will be destroyed and cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. It will lose its value and be superseded by truth. So the context of this verse is that all things pass away except love. I believe that. And I also believe that love virtually does not fail. In other words, when we love in a way that I have described today, it's never a waste of our time, our effort, our resources, or, or any emotional risk. If you love your enemy, he'll cease to be your enemy. In Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 43, Jesus says, You have heard, what you have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, 
so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. I have another story about that one. Tried it, and a man who was once an enemy is now a brother. Love never fails. A story for another time, but um, how does this work in practice? So, Tony, there we go. Um, if this picture of me in my car had a, a thought balloon, the thought balloon would say, you're doing it wrong. You're all doing it wrong. And uh, we know what this arena is like. It's frustrating out on the road. But uh, if I may, could I suggest it as a love your neighbor training course? The course is free. You already have all, everything you need. And you can start out in the privacy of your car anytime you want, out on the road and train yourself whenever you're out driving. First thing you'll need to do is get up earlier. This is going to add time to your commute. You're going to be slowing down. You're going to be letting people in. You're going to, when somebody puts a blinker on, you're going to let them come over. You're going to let somebody come in. Um, and uh, it's, it's going to increase your commute. But the second is, yes, they really are all doing it wrong. It's true. They are. But you cannot teach them the proper way through sign language which makes no difference in that moment anyway. And uh, the thing about it is, you have to be the one that does it right. You have to be the one and hope that other, other drivers see your example. And it may not be satisfying to you at first, but peace will be the first reward. And trust me, if you can show love in this arena consistently, you're on your way to bigger and better things. One more way that love never fails. Matthew chapter 6 says that during a Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about money and he tells us not to store up our treasures on earth, but to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Many believe this verse directs us toward tithing, charity, and away from making money as our idol. I believe it reveals something additional as well. I believe it points toward love, because without love there is no true charity. Hearses don't have trailer hitches, and we take no treasure with us to heaven. The Bible itself is very plain about how everything on this earth will eventually pass away. So without our expressions of love, how else are we to store up any treasures in heaven? I think we could connect the dots and see that whenever we store up our treasures in heaven, how it is that we love on earth is the currency filling that treasure. I don't know where your heart is uh, today, where, whether this message may or not have touched you or not. Um, and you may be thinking, yes, I've known all this for a long time, done my best to live it, and maybe I can still do even better. And I know some of you in here personally, and I know you're very loving people. Um, or you may be thinking, I'm out. There's no way I can even begin to think about loving the people who have done and continue to do me wrong. I know I'm just a sinner working through my salvation, but the bar is just too high. It's a fact. There are people in this world who are never going to come around. The Bible's quite clear about that very thing. And they will either repent from their sins and come to Christ, or he'll judge them in the end. But either way, that's not for us to know. And our job is to love them and pray for them regardless. Romans 5, verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Taking everything the Bible says into account, I'm convinced that if we want to have a more loving heart, and if we pray earnestly for it, he will give us the opportunity to love and grow, and love some more, and grow some more. He will use the people in our lives, and even place people in our lives, in order for that to happen. He will meet us where we are, and he will lead us where we will follow. If my prayer for this message and for us is answered, in the coming days, weeks, and for however long, you won't be able to avoid constant reminders to love each other. That's what I prayed for. You'll see it in commercials or billboards or hear it in song lyrics or other messages, and even whenever you open your Bible, God's thumb will be poking you in the back. The great truth of the day today is this. 
Most of this talk about loving others doesn't work for us unless we are a new creation. I believe that we cannot love others as God would have us to do under our own power. Maybe for a time, but ultimately it's unsustainable. But we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And that was the whole point of me telling you about that day in Israel. I did not do that under my own steam. When we give love the priority that Christ Jesus would want us to, our worldview changes. The call to repentance is the necessary first step, and it always has been. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he said, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. If you picked up a program this morning of the different things inside it, you might uh, remember seeing this. Uh, the front of it's a trillion dollar bill, which is obviously fake and bogus. The back of it, there's a message that is worth an awful lot. In fact, the message on the back is priceless. Um, for those of you that don't have one, I'll just hit the high points. There can only be one truth, that's by definition. And if it's the Bible that tells the truth, consider this. You will meet your Creator God one day. You'll be judged on how you've lived your life and for the free will choices you've made. Do you consider yourself a good person, confident, a loving God, will most certainly accept you into heaven? Well, you cannot earn your way into heaven by doing more good than bad, any more than you can buy your way in even if you had a trillion dollars. No one is that good. You were born with the nature to sin against both God and man. For proof, watch toddlers and see what they do naturally. Only God's amazing and infinite grace can save you from an eternity of suffering. Through Jesus Christ, God offers eternal life in heaven to any and all, no matter what you may have done. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, John 3.16. And it ends with this. Statistics show that 10 out of 10 people will die one day. And when your day comes, God will be calling all the shots, not you. So there will never be a better time than now for you to admit that you are a sinner, believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, confess your sins, and repent, meaning to turn away from them. If we confess our, confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Just take a minute to explain this track. This is something developed um, by a few of us and uh, kind of stole an idea, obviously. Put Mount Rushmore on it because um, one of us in this room, Gene, loves to take these up to Mount Rushmore and hand them out by the thousands every year. And... Uh, it's, it's an act of love. Um, so we like to kind of fantasize a little bit and think, you know, who knows where this is going to wind up. This might uh, be picked up by some kid in New Hampshire who takes it home and puts it in a scrapbook. And then five years from now, he opens up that scrapbook and this thing hits him right between the eyes. I mean, we don't know. We don't know where they're going to go. But uh, I'm chicken. I don't like to go to Mount Rushmore and hand out tracks. They, uh, they send the security down there and hassle you. And I, I'm just uncomfortable with that. Gene's okay with it, though. Um, but I'm more than happy to, to help him in the effort to have the track. So um, there's all kinds of different ways to show love in the community. And um, I can't sit here and listen to the announcement about VBS without thinking that here's all these kids in 80-something now that are going to be showing up here uh, this summer. And what an opportunity for us to come together as a fellowship and be patient and kind and just um, be there and love on those kids. And, and you don't have to look very far. If you're looking for a place to spend love in, uh, in this community, and if you want your church to grow, because I know there's people here that have come from other church homes, I mean, that's what you're going to do out in the community. Nobody's going to really care what landmark community church stands for unless we're out there loving on people on a consistent basis. So that's my little soapbox on that. Um, again, thank you all very much for coming today, um, especially all of you that um, showed up this 
is our new building. It's been here since the fall, and uh, we're still doing kind of tent revival parking out there. And I'm so happy it did not rain and get muddy because that would not have been fun for, for the visitors. But uh, if I don't have a chance to thank you or talk to you personally before you leave, I just, uh, I'm humbled by your presence here today, and it, it means everything to me. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we trust that someone needed to hear this message from your word today, either for confirmation or as conviction. A message that goes straight to the heart and sticks. Lord, help us love one another. Help us stand out in our families, our circle of friends, and in our community as people who are known for our patience and our kindness. And most of all, Lord, thank you for loving us unconditionally and for wanting nothing more than to spend eternity with us each and every one of us. Amen. As we get ready to close, remember that there are prayer ushers on the side if you have prayer re requests for our concerns that need to be shared. And let's stand and sing.
love out into the world this week. Oh